I think one of the most interesting things, Tom Telesco, that that I have seen happen in the NFL this year and, and really in the last year or so is a boldness on the part of a lot of general managers, maybe to make some moves that in the past you really couldn't see coming. And, you know, the couple in this particular case for your year, uh, I think, obviously, trading for Khalil Mack, it was a very, very big deal. And I thought a really good under the radar um, signing for you in free agency was Sebastian Joseph Day, uh, who you get to play defensive tackle from the Rams. And I just know from knowing Aaron Donald a little bit, how valuable he thought Sebastian Joseph Day was. We'll get to all of your uh, signings and and how much I think you're improved. Adding J.C. Jackson, obviously, to play corner, keeping Mike Williams as a really valuable receiver. But I want to start with those two additions on defense. And let's start a little bit with Khalil Mack and tell me how difficult it was to pull off that trade, knowing that, okay, you're not positive really what he has left. He's had some injury history in Chicago uh, and and probably hasn't been quite as impactful as they thought he would be. But you also have a head coach who's got a history with him. Take me into Khalil Mack. Yeah, you know, with with these moves, it's a lot of it's uh, right place, right time, and when it's appropriate. And it's funny, the, the two players you mentioned off the bat, Cleo Mack and, and Sebastian Joseph Day, um, the fact that they have a history with their head coach, it helps. There's no doubt that helps. When you're signing a free agent, when you're trading for somebody, especially when you trade for Khalil, giving up you know a second-round draft pick, which hopefully is a core player down the road, and we also give up a sixth, um, you really got to make sure that player fits. And we can only watch so much on tape. Um, like you said, Khalil had the, had the foot injury last year. Um, but watching him play, we still feel like he has enough left. Like he still, he still affects the quarterback, still plays the run extremely well. Um, but also we knew you know, since Brandon coached him, Brandon knows him inside and out, knows him as a person, knows how much he'll fit here. So that really helped in that decision. And, you know, they have a new head coach, they have a new general manager, you know, their roster is changing. Um, probably not unlike when, when I first arrived here, um, so when you, when you put that into the equation and the fact that we have a history, or not we, but Brandon had a history with Khalil, is something you look at, um, not something we've done a lot with. You know, we haven't made a lot of trades like that in the past, but um, right place, right time, um, certainly appropriate to look at and to really give somebody opposite Joey that people have to account for. And it's going to help both players, um, not only on the field, but then also in the locker room with Khalil. So to have someone like that that walks in the door, um, you know, that, that people have to pay attention to. It's going to help the defense. I remember, I remember, um, and he, he was with him with the Bears in 18 right. when he first got there, right? Correct, yeah. Him for yeah. The, the, right after that trade happened, I'll never forget talking to some of the people in Chicago about him. And it was, even though he's not necessarily a holler guy, and a you know a, a a real a real talkative guy necessarily. As soon as he walked onto that team, he was a focal point for that defense, and that was a good defense already. Very good. Yeah. So I think knowing how much of a factor he was as a leader type guy had to be a good part of that for you guys with this, yeah. and, uh, and with this acquisition. Consistent high level production, um, both with the Raiders and with the Bears, you know, up until last year. And last year he's still producing at a pretty high level until they got hurt. So, but yeah, you take that into account with, um, you know, his veteran experience. I mean, we, our team is on the younger side. We try and sprinkle in some veterans and we've done that this year. We want to have a nice, nice balance of, of, you know, really young players, some, some uh, younger veterans and some older veterans. And that's what we think we've kind of mixed in this year. I think one other, the reason why this kind of made everybody sit up and take notice is that I think most people still believe that even at 31, Khalil Mack still can be a real impact player. 
tell me a little bit about how you think he and uh, he and Joey Bosa will be playing, you know, on the same defense now and how they should anyway allow your defense to have less pressure on, uh, you know, on Bosa because they got to pay attention to both. Yeah, and, and the more pass rush we have, you know, the easier it is on the coverage behind that. So it, they have to marry that up, the pass rush and the coverage. This is a throwing league. Um, you got to have both of those. You know, hopefully we have the lead late in games where we're rushing the passer a lot. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Khalil just gives us, a, you know, a real pass rusher on that side. And, and, and as you scout the player as far as how he's going to fit in our defense, it makes it a lot simpler when we're watching in Chicago, watching a lot of the same stuff we do here. Uh, so that's very helpful. So you're not projecting at all, but you hate to project with a, either a UFA or some of your or veteran you're trading for. We, like we know exactly what we're getting, how he's going to fit. Even a lot of the verbiage is the same. Um, so whether it's a, you know, three down, four down or five down look, you know, it's going to free up other people. It's going to free up our interior defensive line. To get, which we have to get to, it just can't come from the perimeter. Um, but uh, then not to mention, you know, a point of emphasis this offseason was, this offseason was to get better against the run. Khalil brings that as well. I mean, he, he, he can really set the edge on the outside. He's powerful, strong hands, um, really, really instinctive. So, you know, he's got a full skill set to fit that position. And like I said, there's, like I said, there's no projection there. We've seen him do it in that type of defense. The same thing he'll do here. I thought it was interesting you mentioned that because I remember going back to the your last game of the season when you had that crushing loss to the to the Raiders thing I remember about that game is that, you know, when you look back on it, I mean, Derek Carr had some nice throws in that game. He had some big plays, but it was their running game that I thought really kind of wounded you guys. And I don't remember off the top of my head, but I'm guessing they ran for 180 or something like that. And it is oftentimes kind of the little things that are going to help you be better and improve. And, and that's one of the reasons why I brought up Sebastian Joseph Day, because I just think he's the kind of uh, space eater in the middle of the field where he's not maybe your sort of classic, uh, you, you know, he doesn't, he, he's not necessarily a three technique guy and he's not necessarily a 340 pound nose. He's a versatile defensive tackle who plays very, very well against the run. Tell me how you isolated on him and how you were able to get him to come over. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that that Raiders game because whenever you don't make the playoffs and you're that close to it, you tend to really focus on that last game of the year, what went wrong. Um, and like you said, in that game, you know, we did very well against the run the first half, but the second half in overtime, we struggled to stop the run. There were some plays in overtime. If we just get a stop, um, you know, the game ends in a tie and we're still in the playoffs, but I wanted to make sure like, as we went into this off season, um, you know, I, I know we see that last game, but like, you know, mid December, we're playing Kansas city um, for the division lead with four games left and a potential buy. And we, and we lost that game to Kansas city in overtime. You probably remember that. Then we yeah, lost two out of our next three to finish the year. So we didn't finish well. So I knew, you know, for this off season, like we got to have a balanced look of our, of our football team. We don't want to go one way or, you know, too much on one side of the ball, but I also knew defensively because I saw this um, early on when I was with the Colts, we initially Jim Moore was the head coach. Vic Fangio was the defensive coordinator. Um, you know, actually the, the defense that Vic ran with the Colts is, pretty similar to what we run now. I mean, the game's evolved, so it's changed, obviously, but a lot of the concepts are the same. When it changed to Tony Dungy's defense, the skill set required for those defensive players changed dramatically. So this year, or two years ago, we go from Gus Bradley's defense to Brandon Staley's defense, a lot of the same transition. It, it changes the skill set of the players that you need. I probably, uh, probably last offseason, probably overestimated some players I thought would be a good fit that weren't the perfect fit. So as we in this offseason, Luckily in free agency, there were some players that we thought could help us on defense that really fit the scheme well. And obviously, again, with, with Joseph Day, he not only fits it well, but he was playing in the very same scheme with the Rams and our head coach knows him very well. 
Um, so he's just a good fit for us. And as a player, we still think he's got a lot of upside, which you don't always get when you sign an unrestricted free agent. They are kind of what they are a lot of times, four years, five years into the league. We still think he's got a lot left there uh, to get even better. And like you said, he's not your he's not your six foot four, 315 pound nose tackle. Um, but he's got long arms, great leverage, great feel and instincts inside, um, very strong and plays hard um, and has a lot of energy to him. So to sign him, to sign Austin Johnson from the Giants, Austin had a great year last year, um, yeah. another big defensive lineman. So we had to get bigger um, up front um, guys that kind of more fit the scheme of what we're going to play. And to sign those two guys, that was pretty critical to our, our, our plan this offseason. Um you know, the, the sign J.C. Jackson, that was important. We wanted to add another corner. Can never have enough of them, and especially, the, you know, with his talent level and his ability to turn the ball over is so important. Uh, but we had to get better on the defensive line. Now, I shouldn't say better, but we had to change the skill set of what we're looking for in the front because this is different how we're playing now as opposed to um, when Gus was here. They Both schemes work, um, but they require a different uh, set of, um, of skill set for different players. So, um, but they had those two defensive, defensive linemen inside drafted Tito uh, Obonia from UCLA. That name's not easy to pronounce. Um, again, more fits the skill set of we're going to look for inside. Tell me a little bit about uh, J.C. Jackson, why he became a big focus of yours uh, and, and obviously at a, at a huge salary, but why did he become uh, the, the corner who you really wanted? Yeah, you know, free agency is hard. Um, you know, we, we wanted to add a corner in free agency if we could. Um, if we didn't add one in free agency, we're hoping to maybe draft one, but you never know in the draft. Um, with JC, in our opinion, he was the best available in free agency, and just in our opinion. Um, does that mean you always go, go, you know, find the highest paid player you can find and sign him? Not always necessarily, but in this case, we thought it made sense. Um, we like how he plays the game. Um, we, as far as his man coverage ability, and it's really his ability to turn the ball over on a consistent level year after year um, is something we thought would be great for our defense. So um, it was an investment we made in that position, uh, fully knowing it was going to be a big contract. We understood that. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we had a smaller group of corners we, we liked in free agency. Um, it wasn't like there were six, seven, eight different players that we could go to. It was a much smaller list, you know, maybe, maybe three to four that we felt could come in and really help us. And, and we thought he was the best of the four and we thought it was worth the investment. Can you just tell me a little bit about your research into him? And I'm specifically interested in his past relationship with Derwin James and how much that might have been some factor in, in what you did. Because for those who don't know, uh, Derwin James and J.C. Jackson a uh, hundred years ago, we're on the same seven on seven team, I believe. Right. Just tell me, tell me about that and tell me what, if anything that had to do with it. I'm sure you discussed it with, with Derwin James a bit. Yeah. You know, uh, in free agency connections are good. Uh, they really are. It, it's, it's um, in the college draft, we have access to so much information on players that's current Um but when you're an unrestricted free agency, that those players have been with a different team for three years, four years, five years and above. You don't know exactly um, everything about them anymore. A lot of things have changed. Um, but we do like some, some familiarity. Obviously, there was a lot there with Derwin. You'd have to ask JC as far as how much it meant to him to be a part of that. I think it, I think it was a big part of it. Um, the fact that, it, that he wanted to play here, be a part of this and be a part of it with Derwin is, is big. It was a big part of you know, how we ended up here. Um, but I like those connections. Like we had the connection with Khalil, had the connection with Sebastian Joseph Day. Um, we had some connections with, with Corey Lindsley. So we know the type of person that we're going to get. So um, there's so many misses in free agency. You, you try and mitigate some of that risk by knowing exactly what you're going to get. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the relationship goes back pretty far. I didn't know this till after the fact, but um, JC is also working with Edger and James a little bit. And I go really far back with Edger. And so, um, yeah, that's uh, it, it's a big part of it as far as, you know, knowing what you're going to get. And I, I think having Derwin here was a big part of JC's decision. Um, did you have <clears throat> what you felt was a lot of competition for JC Jackson? Because I know that 
after he signed, he said the Chargers were uh, that's the team I wanted to go to all along. Was it what you might call an easy negotiation? Because obviously, at least afterwards, you knew how much he wanted to be a Charger. Yeah, there's there's no easy negotiations. That, that, that's uh, there's no way that's going to happen. Um, yeah, you don't know who you're uh, competing with. You just don't know. Um, obviously, I think for a lot of teams, he was probably um, you know a target. You know, he's one of the best corners that was available, and and still relatively young. So um, yeah, there was competition for him. You, you knew that was going to happen, which is why the contract is what it is. Um, but uh, in the end, you do like, you know, as long as the money is equal, you know, you, you want players to choose where they think they have the best chance to win and where they really want to live and who they want to play with and play for. So uh, we thought we had a lot, a lot to offer um, with Brandon Staley, with Derwin, um, with having Justin Herbert here. And, and you know, we, at that point, um, we had traded for Khalil Mack. So hopefully he saw what we we're putting together here and he wanted to be a part of that. And I think that was part of his decision. I mean, obviously money is very, very important. It's a business. We get that. But there are other aspects of, you know, who do you want to play for? Who do you want to play with? And I think he wanted to be here. So I'm curious from a general manager's standpoint, I think I'm, I've got the dates correct. You signed Mike Williams, the wide re, your wide receiver, on March 8th. So you signed him a week or so before free agency. And you sign him to a what has been reported anyway is a three-year, $60 million contract, which you know, when you think about it, three months ago, $20 million a year was the going rate for the best wide receivers in the game. There was only one guy who was appreciably above that, and that was uh, DeAndre Hopkins, but on a very short-term deal. So, you know, we've seen what has happened over the last two months. You know, it's absolutely exploded. So I wonder, in the wake of all that, are you kind of glad you were aggressive with Mike Williams and didn't wait until a week or two or three into free agency? Yeah, I mean, Mike was a focal point this offseason. We all know we wanted to get him back here. Um, we thought we had the financial capabilities to do that. And just like with J.C. Jackson, I think Mike really wanted to be here. So it takes two to, to, to do that dance, and he wanted to be here. So, um, But we were aggressive with it. And look, the nature of free agent contracts every year, they just stare stuff in value. That's just the way that it is. And um, most times when you sign a UFA, whether it's from another team or one of your own players, you know, the numbers may look big and it may look like, boy, do you think we overspent? But you know what? In a year, certainly in two years, those numbers don't look as bad anymore. So you just got to make sure you put it on the right player. And, and with Mike, you know, we knew Mike, we drafted Mike and, and we know how big he is for our offense. Um, to have him out there with Keenan, have him out there with Austin Eckler. Um, he's just a critical part of the offense. And we're trying to give Joe Lombardi, offensive coordinator, and, and Justin Herbert uh, as many weapons and, a, and the biggest menu possible to go to. And uh, Mike's a big part of that. And uh, so we we're you know, very happy to get that done. I know he was happy about it. But, uh, yeah, these – now, did I think the numbers would get to where they were this year? Not really. Um, I didn't think they'd go to that extent, but that happens. You're going you're to see spikes at different positions over time. Um, this one spike now, we'll see if this is a, you can, really can't call it a trend. It's only been a year for it to spike this much, but we'll see. But I know we're happy to have Mike uh, back here for a number of years. I thought Mike Williams was the kind of difference maker that, um, and look, you know, Keenan Allen is great too, but he's really a different receiver than Mike Williams. Mike Williams is the guy who, it reminds me of sort of your classic big receiver deep threat. And, you know, obviously he's averaged over 15 yards uh, a catch for you guys uh, over the last couple of years, obviously been Justin, one of Justin Herbert's favorite targets. But I think one of the things that people don't see is Mike Williams off the, off the field, Not, or, or I should say um, outside of the game, because Brandon Staley told me a story at the Combine about how at the end of that devastating loss against the Raiders in Las Vegas, he went into the locker room afterwards and he just looked over it at Mike Williams, who is just absolutely, totally, unequivocally spent. You know, he had given everything that he had 
And he said, as devastated as I was, he said, I was just thinking that day, we got to keep this guy. We got, we have to find some way to, to, to keep him. Can you discuss a little bit about the value of a guy who plays the way Mike Williams plays to a team that's trying to get to a championship level? There's no doubt. And, and it's, it's, uh, when you have a number of players like that, it all starts to rub off. I remember it's a couple of years ago, we, we lost to Kansas City uh, in Mexico City. Tough game. And when I saw Austin Eckler in the locker room, um, that he gave as much as he gave and how he felt after that loss. I looked at him and, I, and didn't talk to him, but I never forgot that. I'm like, these are the type of players that we have to have here for the long term. Um, and we have more than, than just Mike and Austin, but but same thing with Mike, you know, um, I happened to come down at the end of the fourth quarter and then into overtime and watched from the sidelines and um, against the Raiders Against the Raiders against the Raiders, which, and it felt, I mean, it wasn't a playoff game, but it felt like a playoff game and it really had playoff imp implications. So um, both teams really, I mean, both teams were spent, um, but Mike in particular had a huge game. Um, he went out for a series in the second half, I think in the fourth quarter, and I'm thinking we need him back on the field. You know, I don't know if we can make this comeback without him. Um, and that's with having, you know, Keenan out there and having Austin out there. Um, Josh Palmer, who was a rookie last year, had made some big contributions for us. Um, but we needed Mike out there for some big plays, and he, and he provided those. Um, but that's the mentality you have to have. I mean, I know this is a business, and, and we all get paid for what we do, but you know, the effort and, and the passion and the love for the game is still a big part of this. And, and you, you have to have that to win in this league. And, um, you know, Mike's not a big talker, um, but his, his, his game shows that. And he sure, certainly showed that, you know, multiple times in his career, but certainly out that last game. And, and, you know, reason why we're trying, you, you try and resign your own when you can, you can't sign them all. Uh, but Mike was a guy that was a focal point to make sure we get back here. Do you think you've helped your defense enough? This obviously was a defense that, you know, when I think about your team last year, you go three and three down the stretch. And uh, in your three losses, you gave up 34 points or more. And, and you scored what I, I don't know, you scored in the high 20s or 30s uh, in every game you played down the stretch last year. Your offense really did enough, but your defense didn't, you only went three and three. Have you done enough with your defense now to be more competitive in a really competitive division? Well, you would hope, but you don't know until you put the pads on, get out there in August, and then we'll see in September. Right now, it's just, it's all on paper. And as you know, once you hit June 15th, nobody really cares what your off season was like. So, um, but we knew this, you know, the transition was going to take time. It doesn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight in Indianapolis when Tony Dungy became the head coach. Um, it took a couple of years to get there. Uh, we knew there'd be a transition on defense. I love the scheme. I love how Brandon coaches it. I love how Ronaldo, Ronaldo Hill coaches it. Um, and we're starting to get some more players that really fit specifically what they're looking for. So, um, I would like to think we're much closer this year than we were last year. Uh, but the proof will be in September, you know, those first, those first four games, um, you know, we'll see exactly where we are in defense, but I'm, I'm optimistic of where we are um, with this group and what we're kind of see how it plays out. What's it like working with Brandon Staley? High energy, high energy. And any, you know, the one thing he really talks about a lot is relationships. Um, and that's all genuine and real. That's relationships, you know, not just with the players, it's with the assistant coaches, it's with the scouts, it's with everybody in the front office, it's everybody in the building. Um, you know, you can talk about, you know, we know this is a business, um, but, you know, when you play on a team together, it, there is a family atmosphere. That's just natural, whether it's high school, college, or professional. Um, but you have to feel that. And with Brandon, you feel that every day. And um, he just has great people skills with the players. Um, he's bright. I mean, he's brilliant, um, but he listens. And he listens to players, listens to, to our leadership council, uh, listens to his coaches. And it's a fun environment to work in. As you see last year, I mean, you can't say we're not, we're not an exciting team to watch play. I know, I know some people may think we probably go a little bit overboard, but that's our identity. That's how we like it. That's how we're going to play. And, uh, you know, you're, you're a reflection of your head coach. And, um, you know, it's exciting, but it's, it's great day-to-day -day working with Brandon. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. How did you feel deep down inside five minutes into the 
second half of the game against the, the Raiders. It's fourth and one at your own 18 yard line. And Brandon keeps the offense on the field and goes for it, ends up not making it. But how did you really feel about that play call? That's the way we had done it all year. So that's just, you know, you can't just say, well, it's, it's the last game of the year and it's really important. Maybe we should be more conservative. That's not who we are. And we had some opportunities during the year with same situation. We went for it and got it and that winning the game. Um, there was another game that weekend. I think it was the Cardinals game, same situation. I believe it was them that went for it. They got it. Nobody said a word. You know, yeah, we went yeah. for it, didn't get it. You know, it's, but you know, my first thought is, Hey, look, he not only trusts the offense, he trusts the defense that if we don't get this, we'll get a stop. And we did help. We held him to a field goal there. Field goal. Yeah. So um, the other part of that, you know, I, I, and it, it's one of the points that I've made when I've discussed this is that uh, you went for it on fourth down seven times in that game, seven times. And you were six for seven. Yeah. And now, you've now just got to take those odds. Now that you know, we, were, we were behind, so we had to go for a couple of those times. But if you're going to make probability based decisions, you can't just say, well, you know what, in this situation, we don't want to do it. You know, we felt we felt, felt like we, the odds were with us, but it's never going to be 100 um, percent. And that particular play, we didn't execute it as well as they executed it. And we didn't get it, but we held no field goal and, and you move on. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we have a quarterback that's very good. We have some skill players that, that are excellent. Um, our offensive line really improved a lot last year. And then we added Zion Johnson in the draft. So we feel like, you know, if, if the probability is with us, you know, we're going to make those decisions to go for it. If we don't get it, we're going to play defense and try and stop them. I kind of like not only the fact that you pick Zion Johnson in the first round because he was, I think, uh, by popular acclaim, probably the best interior lineman in this draft. And not only that, but then you get a bigger back in Isaiah Spiller, who, uh, and again, look, I have no idea what uh, the personnel groupings would be, but maybe Isaiah Spiller, who is whatever he's going to be, 218, 220, maybe he's in the backfield when you have a fourth and one at your own 18. Nothing against Austin Eckler. But, you know, it just gives you another little piece and another little option to work with, probably. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what role he can earn this year. Um, but uh, yeah, adding Zion was was important. If, if you would ask me in 2013, if I'd ever draft a guard in the first round, I would have said no way would we ever draft a guard in the first round. But, you know, you adapt and change. And, and why and now then? What what is what is it about the game now? that made you do it particularly this year? Well, number one, you have to compare it to what else is available at that pick, but just with that position, you know, we have a, a, a big time quarterback. And if we can really solidify the inside of the pocket, left guard, center, right guard, to really build a wall for him, have the tackles run the rushers up the field, to give a nice big wide pocket that our quarterback can step up into, um, that's key. Cause we have some really good skill position players, but to facilitate that we need time. So that was important there. and, and you know, hopefully we have the lead in the second half of some games. When you got to run the ball, when everyone knows you're going to run the ball, Austin Eckler is a big time running back. You know, so the better guys we have up front to help block in the run game, we can run some clock and, you know, close out games. So um, it was, you know, the Corey Lindsley signing was huge. That, that center spot in the offensive line is so important for us. He's the quarterback, just like, just like Justin is. But then I had two guards, Matt Filer last year in free agency and then Zion this year. Now Zion's going to have to come in and, his transition is still going to be a transition for him to, to come into that spot. What Rashawn Slater did last year is really not common. He stepped in from day one, and it was like he played in the league for four or five years. Don't see that very often. Um, we saw it with Derwin James, but you just don't see that very often. Zion, there'll be a little bit of a transition, but we think he's really talented, um, strong, powerful. He can anchor in that middle, but still athletic enough to move, both run and pass. Um, and it's just critical to have the, to have those guys up front to let everybody else do their jobs. Um, you see him play, you see him playing right guard, Tom. Well, yeah, more than likely to be right guard. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I said, I probably wasn't as focused on that when I first started in this, in this business. Um, 
just the way our lines were built in Indianapolis. We didn't put a lot of resources into the, to the two guard spots. We always had Jeff Saturday, who was an all pro. Um, you know, we were focused on tackles, not so much guards, but you know, they're all important. All those guys up front are important. So, um, so he was a, he was a target for us. We we're lucky to have him. I want to ask you two general manager questions right now of things that happened this year that really have interested me about your job. The first is, I thought one of the most interesting things that happened in this draft was a trade that was made between Minnesota and Detroit. A big trade moving up from 32 to 12, which the Lions did to take Jamison Williams and the uh, Vikings went back. They got a really good safety in Lewis scene. And then they got one more pick in the top 65 than they would have had. And I think that is the reason why uh, Kwesi Adolfo Menza made this deal. He liked the depth up high a little bit more than he liked the player at whoever the player would have been at 12. But I'm just curious, is there an unwritten rule in the Tom Telesco book about trading with general managers and teams in your own division? Is that kind of verboten or not really? I would have a hard time, especially in the first round, I would have a hard time trading with the team in our division. Um, I don't wanna, cause I would feel like I'm half helping them, half yeah. help me, but half helping them. I, I would have a hard time with that. I know for this year, I was looking at different possibilities of possibly trading down and the chiefs had two picks, you know, at the bottom of the round. I'm like, there's no, I can't trade with the chiefs. I can't, I, wouldn't, I just, I don't know. If, I don't think I could do that to help them come up and get a player they like. So yeah. So there is a rule for me. Um, I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. Maybe I need to, to uh, reevaluate that, but I'd have a hard time trading with an in-division team that high in the draft. It was something later on. I probably wouldn't, wouldn't bother me as much. Um, but, uh, and then I certainly wouldn't want to make a player for player trade with the team in my division. I just don't think I would trust them. And they're all great people, you know, and they're really good at what they right. do. But in the end, it's a business. So, yeah. uh, and in the end, I thought that Minnesota trade, I thought when it first happened, I was surprised at the compensation after the draft. I looked at it and I said, I, I like this for both teams. I thought it was a really good trade. Um, yeah. And the biggest thing you got to work, you know, with the trade is who are you going to get? You know what type of player you're going to get, and the player that the Vikings got is an excellent safety. I mean, you know, we 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 loved him. He's a great player. So, um, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it, I just I was totally fascinated by it, and I talked to Brad Holmes, the GM of Detroit, and he said, "Look, I if I think I'm going to improve our team, I'll trade with anybody." Um, and I'm I have not talked to uh, Quasi Adolfo Mensa about it. Uh, this is his first year running a draft with with Minnesota, but I, I just, it was a totally fascinating, just different deal. And yeah. here's the other GM type thing I wanted to ask. So this year seemed to me to be a really different draft in that, uh, and maybe it's just an outlier, one quarterback picked in the top 70, zero running backs picked in the top 35. So in the top 35 picks in this draft, there was one quarterback and zero running backs. I mean, if you go back 15, 20, 30 years, that would be the craziest thing of all. I mean, first of all, the running backs. I mean, everybody, you know, until very recently, running backs were very commonly picked in the first round. Tell me if things are changing in terms of value of certain positions now, or do you think maybe this year is just an outlier? Well, I know one year is not a trend, but um, there are certainly positional values um, that you have to look at. And just like I mentioned with the guards earlier, I mean, I mean, typically taking a guard in the first round, is that a really high price guy at the end of his contract? You know, not necessarily, you know, you may want to, you know, an edge rusher, a quarterback, maybe a receiver that, that, you know, um, you're going to have for five years, um, you know, get a salary cap benefit from that. Um, but there's definitely positional values you look at just based on what they're going to make. I mean, we all have the same salary cap and it's a hard cap. So you have to project out, you know, what they're going to be at the end of their contract. So um, they're certainly involved in that now. Now, as far as 
the quarterback position this year, I mean, I just think that was just a one-year anomaly. Um, it yeah. just happens. I mean, um, I, it's been so strong over the last couple of years. Maybe this is just a corrector a little bit. Yeah. Um, and same thing with running backs. Um, I just thought it was a very deep running back class. I mean, there was a couple, couple of guys up high, but there was a big group of backs that were pretty much ability-wise very similar. So if you feel like, you know, you can get a, a comparable player a little bit later on, you can take a different position. Uh, that maybe, you know, say like a defensive lineman, there aren't very many defensive, big defensive linemen that draft each year. Um, there aren't a lot of talented offensive linemen. So you maybe draft one of those guys earlier and you get a running back later just because there's more running backs. There's more running backs in college. As you see now, there's so many receivers coming out of college. So that pool is just bigger um, than, say, O-line, D-line. So there is definitely positional value in the draft. And a lot of this, you know, even though, you know, the salary cap is, you know, you don't really think about salary cap in terms of the draft, but it does, it is in, in your thinking uh, when you're drafting these players, certainly in the first round um, for, as far as positional value. Uh, I'll end with this. Did you, um, when you look at your division right now, adding Russell Wilson, and obviously there have been other changes, but you look at your division and I wonder if it impacted at all how you did business this off season or how you wanted to do business this off season. Not really. Cause you know, we probably a couple of weeks after the season ended when we start to really discuss what our, what our, you know, what our plan is for this year, our strategy, um, you know, by the time those deals were done, I don't think it really impacted us. Um, you can't help but notice, you know, when, you know, Russell Wilson goes to the Broncos and, you know, the Chiefs are the Chiefs and they're getting better, obviously. I mean, they don't have to get better. They're already the best team in the, in the division. But you see everything the Raiders are doing. You can't help but notice it. Um, but uh, it really didn't change, you know, what our plan was this offseason. We, we saw how we played in 17 games last year. We knew what we had to do on both sides of the ball to get better and on special teams. Um, so, yeah, it did not impact it, um, but you can't help to – watch what's going on and this it's uh it just seemed like every player that was you know comes available ends up in our division at some point <laughs> not, not a spot you know it, it was like one after another i mean the, the Devonte adams one i was i was off doing i think i was doing an interview somewhere when it broke and i said you got to be kidding me like it was just you know didn't see that one coming so um but i'll tell you what the teams that come on our division this year they're going to be battle tested because our game yeah. with the raiders um, with Kansas City, with Denver, they're going to be like playoff games. I mean, our division games, I mean, they count really count two in the standings um, for each game. So I remember, hey, Tom, I remember uh, I covered the New York Giants for Newsday for four years in the 80s. And, and that was at a time when, uh, when the Giants got to the Super Bowl a couple of times and they were in the playoffs. Washington won three Super Bowls in that period of time. And, and Dallas was, you know, late in the eighties getting better, but, you know, they had been good for a long time before that. But I remember one day asking Bill Parcells, why have so many teams from the NFC East made charges in January? Why, why, why have there been so many teams in the NFC East that have gone on to be very good in the playoffs that year? And he, he used the word you just used before. And he said, because we're battle tested, we are not, we play six games in our division and I don't care who we play, the Bears, the Niners, whoever, I don't care who we play. We, they are not going to be any tougher and any better than the teams we play in our division. So whoever comes out of our division has got a real good chance to go very far in the playoffs. I think it's exactly right what you're saying. By the time Can't you rest. get, if, if you make the playoffs, you will have already played four or five, maybe even six division playoff type games this year, you know? And like, you know, there's the old saying, high water raises all boats. And that's really what it is. I mean, the draft ends the next day, you know, hey, Kyle Van Oy could help us. He can really help us in a role. Um, I mean, look at our division. Like, look what we have to compete against, you know, week after week after week. So, you know, that was something we, that we went after. And, you know, we think he's going to be a great addition, but it just never ends. Um, even between now, when we break for vacation, even through vacation, 
you're constantly looking to add the best. If you don't have it going into training camp, more than likely you won't have it coming out. You, know, you may be able to, you know, maybe a couple of waiver claims at the cut to 53 to help out some depth, but you really need that depth going into training camp. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who's going to get hurt. You don't know what player may not perform the way you thought he's going to perform. So try and build the strongest team you can going into camp. Maybe you can add a couple as you, as you break camp around Labor Day and then let it ride after that. And just, but even during the season, you're constantly looking to try and, you know, bolster your team, you know, give your coaches the best possible resources they have and uh, just never ends. One of Kyle Van Noy's years in New England, I think it was 2019, um, his last year there before he went Miami and then went back to New England. I remember I voted for him on my all pro team, my first team all pro team. And I, I didn't have, I couldn't back it statistically. He might've had seven sacks or something like that. But my whole point was every time I watch the Patriots, he's in the middle of five huge plays in the game. And that's what I think of when I think of Kyle Van Noy. He might not at the end of the year, let's say he plays I have no idea what he'll play. 25 snaps a game. I, I have no idea what he'll play. But I will guarantee you that he will have made at the end of this year six, seven, eight, nine plays where you said, we won the game in large part due to one of these plays that Kyle Van Noy made. Now here's, he here's, just, here's he's simple, just he's such an instinctive player. Here's simple scouting. So who do you like? Who do you not like playing against? Well, I don't like playing against Mahomes and Tyree Kill because they're they're big time players. Well, Kyle Van Noy is one of those players. Like I don't like playing against Kyle Van Noy because he's so smart and instinctive. He can do so many different things on the defense. Um, so that's I mean that's number one in scouting. Who's hard to play against? Kyle Van Noy is very hard to play against. He was in New England. He was in Miami the year that he was there. Um, so we played them the year at Miami when he was there. Um, there's a lot of things well. He plays a position the way you, you the way it's taught. Um, so to add a guy like that, add him to the mix, add him on defense, um, that, that was big for us. Hey, Tom Telesco, thanks so much for taking all this time and uh, reviewing your offseason. I think you guys are, you've done so much to get better. You already were a borderline playoff team, but, and I don't want to jinx you. I'll be very surprised if you're not playing deep into January this year. But thank you so much for taking the time and best of luck this year. Anytime. We'll see you on your camp tour when you come through in August, all right? I will. Thanks a lot, Tom. Take care. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.